Welcome to the Up Podcast, raw, real talk on everything young parenting. From self-care, co-parenting, and family planning, to balancing school, work, relationships, and goals. Together, we're challenging society's assumptions and building a safe and supportive community for young parents. One honest conversation at a time. So join us on the journey. Hey guys, welcome back to the Yup Podcast, where, as you know, we talk all things young parents. Here we have Divine. And I'm Brandy. And today's super duper special because we have a young parent, a young mom who's on our Youth Advisory Council and just super duper duper involved in Yup. And she's going to be talking about all things birth experience, her experience as a doula, preparing for birth, and buckle up because it's going to be a wild ride, y'all. Hey, Justice. Do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and what you'll be talking about with us today? Hi, guys. Sure. So as Brandy said, um, my name is Justice. I'm a young mother, first-time mom to a 17-month-old um, and I'm also a birth and postpartum doula. Um, and today I'm just going to be chatting a little bit about my birthing experience, how I prepared, why I pre- um, prepared the way that I did, and also just a little bit of my background as a birth and postpartum doula. Okay, let's talk about childbirth because woo child. Um, Justice, can you tell us <laughs> how you prepared and just what that looked like for you? Yeah, so um, with the birth of my daughter, it was really important for me to prepare as much as I could. Um, Being a young mom, there was a lot that I just didn't know. I didn't have the experience of, and I didn't have just the education um, behind it. Um, I do have education as a doula, but it's, it's definitely different when you're in the experience yourself versus helping someone um, through the experience. So I really took it upon myself to get as educated as I possibly could. Um, That started really, really early on in my pregnancy. So for childbirth, um, there are various things um, that can become a concern or you have fears around. And so I basically doulaed myself, if that makes sense. So the way that I work um, with my doula clients is really just educating them and informing them so that they're able to make educated, informed decisions. Um, I don't make decisions for them. I don't speak for them unless, you know, that's been explicitly expressed by them that they would like me to do that. But for the most part, the way that I approach my doula work is really just educating folks. So that's how I I approached it with myself. Um, So one of the, the first steps that I took was scoping out different classes and, um, trainings. And one of the first classes that I took was a childbirth education class. Now, as a doula, I did take probably four or five um, childbirth education classes, and they were taught all by different people. Um, Some were just childbirth educators. Other ones were taught by doulas. Um, A few of them were taught by midwives. So there were a lot of different perspectives. Um, But I just felt, like I said a second ago, it's definitely a different experience when you're experiencing it yourself versus when you're supporting someone, which is the reason why I decided to take another class on top of the education I already had. And doing so allowed me to see it um, and receive the information in a totally different way and different perspective. Um, So I started with a childbirth education class, and I really wanted to prioritize a class that wasn't taught through a hospital. Um, As a doula, I always recommend classes that aren't taught through hospitals, um, just because the way that the, you know, hospital system is structured, a lot of their classes are structured around the birth that they're hoping that you'll have or that they want you to have. Um, So it doesn't really explore all your possible options for pain medicines or movement um, or anything like that. Um, So I knew going into my pregnancy that I wanted to try and have an unmedicated birth, um, which is also another reason why I prioritize getting educated and preparing so much. So as well as taking a childbirth education class, I also took classes specifically for birthing people who were trying to pursue an unmedicated birth. 
Um, so me and my boyfriend also took classes for different breathing techniques and different movements and um, different labor positions. Um, we took a class for lactation um, and how to prepare for your breastfeeding journey and different things like that. So like I said, this began early in my pregnancy. Um, and this is one of the things that I, I like to express to people is that you don't have to wait. Like you don't have to wait until you're showing. You don't have to wait until your second trimester. You don't have to wait to get educated. Um, I tell clients, potential clients, even people that I'm just talking to, just having a conversation with, like the minute you become pregnant, it's time to really start preparing. It's um, especially if you already have in mind what kind of birth that you want or what kind of birth would be most ideal to you. Um, you definitely want to start as early as possible. And you don't really even have to be pregnant to, to get educated on these things. If you've ever had a pregnant friend, if you have family members, you know, just people in your life who are pregnant, um, it's definitely valuable information to have. Um, so yeah, just with my personal journey, um, definitely education and preparation was so important to me and I valued it so much. And I also valued the people who were going to be closely supporting me also get that education. So as I mentioned, um, my boyfriend and I, we attended various classes, but I knew that my sister, um, I knew I wanted her to be present at my birth. And when I think back to this, I do get a little, I do feel a little guilty because um, I feel like most people have their mom attend their birth. But when I got pregnant, I was like, I do not want my mom there. She's too dramatic. She's going to stress me out. <laughs> like she's going to do the most. And I knew I wanted an unmedicated birth. And my mom is very much like, you know, are you sure? You know, don't, you know, you don't get a trophy basically. Mm -hmm. Um. And not that she didn't support my birth and my vision, but just I knew that I didn't want the high stress and the intensity. And I knew my sister would be way more supportive in the sense that she kind of would follow my lead and just do what I told her to do. Um, so having my sister there was a, a very big help, but it also meant that she was just as responsible as getting educated. So I found a free community um, birth class, um, childbirth education class. And it was, it happened in four different parts and it was like three hours long and I made her attend <laughs> each session. <laughs> um, and when me and my boyfriend would attend classes, I would have notes. I would ask like the instructor if there were any kind of slides or information that she could share with me, um, that she was willing to share with me if she could do so, so that I could also share those with my sister. Um, so there was just all, all along the way um, in my experience and my pregnancy and childbirth experience, I really, really prioritized being educated. And as a young mom, I think I prioritized that so much because we are disproportionately affected by obstetric violence and, you know, being taken advantage of and not being taught what our options are. And a lot of us go through childbirth two, three, four times and think that we don't have options and we don't have choices and not knowing the the different avenues or the different ways that we can give birth because no one ever taught us or we didn't have access to those resources. So, and that's another thing that I have to acknowledge in my experience is that I was fortunate enough to already have a network of educators and midwives and people that I could call on and rely on for education um, but I do realize that there are large communities um, of young women, young mothers, and young parents who don't have the same access. And I think that's one of the biggest things as my doula is, as being a doula, excuse me, why I pr prioritize education the way that I do, because it's not accessible. Um, and you would think now with the age of technology and social media and all of those things that it would be, um, you know, but it still isn't. And there's a huge gap and there's a huge, um, it's just inaccessible to a lot of people who really need it and who could really um, get value out of it. And coming from a teen parent myself, my mother was a teen mom, my parents were teen moms and hearing her birth story and her birth trauma and having hard conversations with her where she didn't really even realize that that's what it is. She didn't know that the feelings 
and resentment and anger that she had. And, and she didn't really even realize that the fact that she couldn't really even talk about her birth experiences mm-hmm. was in itself birth trauma, was in itself a lack of being, you know, taught what her, her options were. And um, so I think that's what really influences my work as a doula and what really influenced my experience with my own pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Um, and during my pregnancy, I didn't mention, but during my pregnancy, I did get my prenatal care through a birthing center, which was a completely different experience than um, anyone close to me had ever experienced. So one of the biggest ways that my care and my treatment was much different was everything was informed. (laughs) Everything was consensual. And uh, when I tell people that, they're like, what do you mean consensual? Like, what were they doing or not doing? And it really was just basic things that should be basic practice for all practitioners of everything. But one of the examples that I use is um, one of my very first appointments at the birthing center, I had to get a physical done and they do like a breast exam and um, a path exam. And the nurse practitioner who was doing it asked my permission every time before touching me. She's like, is it okay to pull your shirt up? Can I begin now? Is it okay to, to begin your pap exam now? Is it okay if I put my hand here? And it took me back it took my boyfriend back as well because he was like, what? Like, I didn't even know. And I remember him making the comment of like, I didn't even know they had to ask. And it's like that for me as a doula, it's like, we're so ingrained, especially pregnant women and pregnant people to believe that our body isn't ours during pregnancy, that now it becomes this kind of a spectacle of like, of course you're going to be touched. Of course you're going to be examined and, And so that experience in the birthing center really was a huge change for me and really impacted my experience because I was like, I I did have a few prenatals with um, my regular like OB um, through a hospital, my family doctor, and it wasn't like that at all. (laughs) And I've been at her practice for years, but it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, she wasn't taking the extra step and the extra care to just ask for the permission Um, so that's one of the biggest ways or differences for me during my experience where I was like, okay, I might've, I definitely did choose the right, um, avenue and the right way to go about this. Um, and, and going through a birthing center also helped support the birth that I wanted to have. Um, because there were a lot of midwives who already had experience working with people who didn't want pain meds or who wanted an unmedicated birth and, wanted to move freely during labor and things like that. So another one big thing that I always tell clients, doula clients, and even friends and family members is like, you want to be able to hire because essentially you're hiring your doctors, you're hiring your midwives. You want to be able to hire these people who are in support of the birth that you're having. You don't want to hire someone who doesn't necessarily believe in your body's ability to give birth. You don't want to hire somebody who doesn't believe that you can go unmedicated or, um, and even the opposite end of that spectrum of you want to hire someone who's going to support your use of epidural and pain medicines and, you know, and your induction and things like that. Um, but yeah, I've been rambling for a little bit, so (laughs) I'll open it up to see if you have any questions. Um, thank you so much, Justice, for sharing those really important aspects of birthing that, Like you said, a lot of people aren't educated about, and I can just say from experience, um, you know, being pregnant at 16 and having my daughter at 17, I didn't even know there were different options and different Mm -hmm. ways to give birth. You know, Mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, go to the hospital, you know, like the norm statistic of how women have birth. And I thought another really touching piece that you shared was, you know, your mom's testimony because, and even your um, perspective of having your sister in the room with you, because, whoa, it makes a difference. If Mm -hmm. I'm being real with y'all, I had my daughter before the pandemic. So there were a lot of, um, I think the max was maybe five people allowed in the room. Mm -hmm. But when I tell you I was such in a place where kind of like you said where it wasn't my body it was Mm -hmm. more so 
like you said, some spectacle of the birthing experience that really didn't include me as mm -hmm. a mother. And mm -hmm. there were so many who people who wanted to be in the room where I felt like I didn't have a say, whether mm -hmm. it was aunts, uncles, in-laws, cousins, people were literally hiding in my bathroom, tapping in and mm -hmm. out of the shower rooms. I had gospels in the back, McDonald's in the back, recording. It was like a hot mess, church mm -hmm. session, music video, all in one. And mm -hmm. Looking back, I did not feel comfortable at all. I didn't look mm -hmm. my best. I didn't feel my best. And I'm sure my my daughter's other side of the family has recordings of my private parts, of really intimate memories that I wish I was, you know, only able to share with whether it been my mom or even my daughter's father at the time. But I didn't even realize that I had that choice because mm -hmm. like that it, it wasn't about me anymore. It was about mm -hmm. everybody else's wants. And that's really hard to kind of make those decisions, if not educated on that you had that opportunity. Yeah, definitely. It's also like, that's, that's why I mentioned what I do as far as when people come to me and, and I want to express too, like not even just do the clients, like people who are pregnant, who are coming to me, like, okay, where do I start? What do I do? Um, like I stress to them so much where it's like, if this is your experience, this is right. your, like, this is the most intimate, most significant, some might argue the most important day of someone's life of giving right. birth, bringing a child into the world. And regardless of how you do it, whether you do it in a hospital, at your house, a birthing center, you deserve your environment to be supported. And also when you look at science and you look at statistics and you see how people, how well labor progresses and how well people do during labor when they're in an environment where they feel safe and supported and not distracted and all of those things, it's like, why wouldn't you allow people to have environments where they, where they feel safe and comfortable enough to be because I know myself I was butt naked during labor I didn't want not want nobody else <laughs> in the room I didn't want you know it was me my sister and my boyfriend and even my midwife she was like I'm gonna let you do what you need to do I'll come in and check every 45 50 minutes come check in on you make sure everything is going well but other than that she's like I don't have a reason to touch you I don't have a reason to be in here you know what you're doing and when I talk about my birth experience, of course, there are things that didn't go the way that I, I wanted to um, or that I was expecting. I also have to acknowledge and realize that I am blessed that I did have the experience that I wanted and I did give birth in the environment and the space that I wanted to give birth in and have the people there um, because it's so, so important. And it, it also goes back to the point where we both mentioned, like, you're not a spectacle just because right. you're pregnant. You know, it doesn't open up uh, your consent. It's not on, you know, your your consent is still ongoing. So if someone wants to touch your belly, they should ask. If someone wants to hold your belly, they should ask. If someone wants to, you know, take pictures of you. And that's another thing um, during birth, like with a doula, is I always like to ask people, like, if there are certain responsibilities, at least in the births that I've supported, if there are certain responsibilities that they really want me to be in charge of. So if that's telling the family member what to do so they don't have to deal with it or taking pictures or taking video, I always like to make sure that that's explicitly stated and expressed so that I know. Um, and an example of that is I supported my sister during her birth. And that was an interesting experience for me because she wanted me there regardless of if I was a doula or not. But since I am a doula, she was like, of course you'd be my doula. Um, but for me, it was an interesting dynamic because it, there were so many moments where I wanted to be her sister, but I had to remember that I was her doula. Mm -hmm. So when my nephew was born, I wanted to rush and take pictures and send, you know, send our family group chat pictures and announce his birth and announce. But that wasn't my place because I'm her doula. Like I had to take a step out of that relationship and realize that there's still that that support and that role that she's expecting of me to play and just because of the nature of our relationship doesn't change the fact that this is her birth this is her moment this is her child 
and she deserves for it to go the way that she wants it to go. Um, so I always, I just, I thought of that example when you were talking, because it's like people also blur the lines of your, their relationship to you once you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I do think that there's a huge wave of like entitlement or why wouldn't I be at your birth or I should be at your birth when you become pregnant. Um, so it's always interesting to see like people's feelings and their opinions once you've expressed like your expectations and your boundaries. Yeah. yeah. I think that's great. And thank you all both for sharing that. Um, I definitely, cause I definitely had found out weeks later that my grandma was hiding in the corner. Did not know she was there. <laughs> Did not know. <laughs> but, um, but another thing that you talked about was birth trauma. And I think that that is something that people do not talk about. I think that there's a huge stigma around having a plan for your birth and it not going according to plan. And what does that look like for you as a woman, as a mother, as a birthing person? Um, Cause I know for myself, I had a very traumatic birth and I went in extremely uneducated, mm -hmm. um, did not need all the interventions that that I had that ended in an emergency C-section, right? And so mm -hmm. something like that after laboring for, I think it was like 20 some odd hours and it to end that way after pushing mm -hmm. for three hours and all these things, right? Um, at the end of it, I didn't tell people my birth story for years. And the reason mm -hmm. being was because there was so much stigma and shame around C-sections, right? I was like, I had to prove to myself that I'd be able to have the birth that I wanted to have the next time around, or I had to prove to myself that like, I did labor all this time, I promise. And I did labor all this time before mm -hmm. getting the epidural. And this is the reason why I got the epidural, right? And it felt like I had to explain myself mm -hmm. to who I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there was so much shame mm -hmm. around that and around that outcome that it really impacts right. people for months, years, it impacts their future birth. So I appreciate you talking about that, but I'd love to talk a little bit more about that, about just when it doesn't go according to plan or when there is trauma and what does that look mm -hmm. like? Um, how can your support system support you and how can you support yourself and really be vocal and be proud that your body did this amazing thing, no matter how it did it, right? Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's it's definitely heavy to talk about um, birth trauma, trauma relating to even a traumatic pregnancy um, is lasting on someone for years. And I think for me, at least with the way that I practice doula work and the way that I practice, you know, advocacy in general with my doula clients is really from the very beginning, like I previously mentioned, from the very beginning, when you find out you're pregnant, you come up with your vision. Like one of the exercises that I even have doula clients do is like them and their partner or whoever they're going to be going through this experience with write up a vision for how they like a birth visualization. Like how do you picture your birth? How, what's the most ideal environment and situation? And that helps to then close in on, okay, do you want meds? do you not want meds? Are you, you know, going to move during labor? Are you going to lay in bed? Are you going to use music? Are you going to use water? And so it helps us kind of narrow down their options or not options, but what they're going to be choosing to do. And also building out their birth plan. That's another reason why I'd like to just try and get educated on it as much as possible, because if something doesn't go as planned and like in my birth, I think it's a good example of like during labor and during and birth, your baby and your body make the rules. <laughs> like you can't, you know, you can't predict what's going to happen. You can prepare. Like I prepared so much and I took so many classes and my baby was born at six centimeters. I was like, I had no idea that this was even possible, let alone mm -hmm. going to happen to me. And she had to get, um, monitoring done and they stuck the monitor on her head while she was still inside and like that wasn't my plan and I felt horrible and mm -hmm. and so but I, I allowed the wiggle room in my my birth plan for for things like that I allowed space in, in my plan and I was realistic with myself to say like this is how I want things to go but I'm also comfortable if this doesn't go this way I'm comfortable with this and so I talked about 
those the plan B. Um, at least personally in my experience, that's what I did. That was my plan. So I talked my my boyfriend and my sister were my main two support people. So when we talked about my birth plan, when we went to prenatals, I talked, okay, I, I want to be unmedicated, but if it gets to a point where I can't take it anymore, then I'll use laughing gas. Or if I can't use laughing gas, I'll get up and I'll try to move or I'll use counter pressure. So I tried to always make sure that we did discuss the plan B in case the plan B was necessary. And I think that also can be a help to like for someone to avoid birth trauma. It's like having a plan definitely helps, but also being comfortable with being flexible and being able to ebb and flow with that plan also definitely helps because if you only educate yourself on having an unmedicated birth or having a, a epidural, a medicated birth with an epidural, and then your epidural uh, fails yeah. and you, you haven't educated yourself on other options, that's going to, the intensity of that birth trauma is going to be 10 times worse because yeah. then it's going to be the doctors and the providers telling you, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. This is what you can do. And your, your options are slowly going to less and less because you didn't educate yourself on what you're comfortable with, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um. So that's why I just always like to educate on various options, even if you don't think that you're going to want something. It's nice to just know about it. It's nice to know the risk. It's nice to know the benefits. That way, if something goes left, which in birth, the possibility of something go left is always possible. Um, you at least are informed and you can make you can make an informed decision. And it's not something where you feel like you're in the throes of labor and you're being forced to do it or something's being done to you. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. It really is such a comfort you know hearing your testimony and the advice that you have to share and it just makes this conversation just that important and even the work that you do as a doula I find very important because I told Justice I want her to be my doula for my next <laughs> birth because even though myself and I'm sure many others in the world didn't have the best experience, knowledge, support, resources, it gives me hope, you know, for my next pregnancy and, and for, the, for the young parents who are going to watch this podcast and just know that, you know, education is available. Like, like mm -hmm. you just said, I didn't even know laughing gas had any relation to birthing experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's just such a cool thing to be able to learn these things, whether it be for family future planning or to just spread the word and educate mm -hmm. other young parents like we are doing now. So thank you tremendously, Justice, for mm -hmm. you know sharing those insights. Definitely. I also wanted to mention, too, that with birth trauma, it's it's hard because it's one of those things where you can't force people to talk about it. And I would never force anyone to talk about it. but it's one of those things where the more that we talk about it and the more that we share our experiences, the more it can help us. So right. we don't have to sit in the shame of it and the silence of it alone because there, unfortunately there are so many of us who carry birth trauma or pregnancy trauma or just trauma as far in parenthood regardless. And I think if we were open, more open with those experiences and that trauma, we would be able to actually build a community with people who have experienced the same things we and, and find comfort in that. Mm -hmm. um, because right now it's something where, like Brandy mentioned, it's like you feel guilty, you feel like shameful, and you feel like you have to convince yourself. Because that is how I felt when um, during my birth, I didn't want any cervical exams. But then I got to the point where I was like so antsy and just tired where I wanted to know how far along I was. And it ended up not meaning anything <laughs> in the long run, but I still felt afterwards, I felt like I had to like justify it or like over explain to people when I was sharing my birth story and things like that. Um, as well as like the, the monitoring for my daughter when um, she got the monitoring where they, they hooked the wire to her head while she's still inside um, the yeah. womb. And the way that it's described is that it's a sticker, but it's not a sticker. It's a nope. tiny, tiny screw 
yeah. that screwed into the baby's skull. Wow. And my nurse had described it as a screw, uh, as a sticker. And I knew it wasn't a sticker. But mm-hmm. in the moment, I felt more comforted with the the word sticker than I did with the word screw. So when she said st- sticker, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, we're losing her heart rate. It's fine. Go ahead and do it. And she's like, oh, it'll only be for a little bit and it's not harmful. And afterwards, when I realized <laughs> the, you know, the reality of my decision and me consenting to that, it, I felt embarrassed and I also felt guilty because I'm like, it's not a sticker, it's a screw. Mm-hmm. And I should have chose something else. I should have, you know what I mean? And so I had to convince myself that me deciding to do that was okay. Um, And like you mentioned, Bernie, I I was a little bit embarrassed. Like, I didn't want to tell people. I didn't want to talk about that part. Or, like, I would tell my birth story and, like, skip over that part. Yeah. Um, But like I said, like, sharing our experiences is, I think sharing our experiences, as cliche as it sounds, is what's going to heal us. Talking about it, not being afraid of it, not feeling like it's, like, baggage that we have to carry or or you know just an embarrassment because like you said like our bodies created a person birthed that person you know if you breastfed they fed that person um so I think there's a lot of positives in it and there's a a lot of beauty in it uh we just have to as a society as a whole has to get over the hunch of like shaming moms or shaming birthing people for that trauma and for And I also think, too, it's a little bit ironic that we're shamed by the same system that's giving us the birth trauma. Um, But yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You know, it's so interesting because my daughter also had the internal monitoring and I, there was a hustle and bustle, Mm -hmm. like they lost her heart rate and they came all rushing in and didn't even tell me what they were doing. I had no clue. Um, Mm -hmm. And so the consent piece is really, really, really interesting. And to find out later and to see the little scab that it made in her head and Mm -hmm. all of that, I think that's really important to talk about. And just for birth workers, hospitals, all of that to understand that if you're not educating the person giving birth and then this thing happens, it's just, it can be really traumatic. So thank you. I know we talked about a lot of heavy stuff. I'd love for us to end on something silly Mm -hmm. like what's one quick funny thing that happened during your birth um and I can start because Mm -hmm. I always remembered I was young and I remembered my mom's best friend telling me that she pooped during labor and I just thought that that was like (laughs) the funniest thing ever and so when I pooped Mm -hmm. during labor um people were like oh gosh she pooped and I just like started cracking up like I thought it was the funniest because that's the only thing that I could feel one and two I just Mm -hmm. remember like this is a badge of honor I have made it as a parent Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm so glad that you found that funny because I didn't find that funny at all and that is I (laughs) share the same funny experience and I didn't even know I pooped until I was told about it after and I was just like don't you ever repeat that again like ew I was like so disgusted but looking back and having these conversations it's so nice to like see the joy of that because that is something I was super embarrassed by and I didn't know until like later on in life that is such a common thing. Mm-hmm. And I was just super ashamed about it. And I was just like, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> you know? And it's funny because I've even seen like, obviously, comical videos of like people having diarrhea. So I was just mm-hmm. thankful that I didn't experience that. But I shout out and commend the women who do because it's such a natural thing we are (laughs) all human beings and I'm not ashamed about it I pooped Mm -hmm. period yeah I hate I hate to piggyback off of this but mine also involves poop um I when I was talking about labor and everything I'm like oh I hope I don't poop like my my biggest thing was like I was scared that I was gonna throw up only because I hate throwing up like I will sob after I throw up and so I was like, I hate, I hope I don't throw up. And then I, I like later on in my pregnancy, I was like, I hope I don't poop. Cause like, 
you know, towards pregnancy, you start to get the loose stools. And I was like, I can't control what's happening. Like I have no control. I don't know what's going to happen. And so during labor, I kept feeling like, like something was coming out of my butt. I was like, something is like coming out of my butt. I feel it. And the midwife is like, oh no, it's just the pressure from her. Like it's no, you know, it's just her bearing down. And, um, so I didn't, so what was told to me was that I didn't poop during labor. My sister's like, no, you didn't poop. My boyfriend, no, you didn't poop. The midwife, no, you didn't poop. I'm going through my camera of pictures and I gave birth on my side. I gave birth on my side. And so I, there's a picture of me on my side right after pushing Megacy out. My my foot is in the air and I'm like, I zoom into the picture and I'm like, there's poop on my butt. Like there's literally, I pooped. My God. <laughs> after the fact, I'm like, why did y'all tell me I didn't poop? Here I am flaunting around like, oh yeah, I didn't poop during labor. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't have that. And I, the whole time I did. And then it's also just makes it funnier for me too, because when legacy, so during labor, um, when I was having my daughter, she, she actually pooped when she was still inside. So she, there was already meconium like in my waters. And so when she got out, there was like, there was poop everywhere. She, like mm-hmm. I had it all over my arm. She had it all over her back. So it was just a really poopy situation from the very beginning. <laughs> and I just always think about that. I'm like, you know, everybody does poop during labor, but I really just thought I was the one person that, you know, got away with not doing it. But Justin, did you ever like ask them later on, like, why did you keep that a secret from me? Like the well, poop they is- st- they, they still are like, well, you didn't poop. I'm like, do you not see the picture that I'm seeing? Like, that's not what my butt looks like on a regular day. Like, <laughs> it is poop. I poop. So I think you're just, like, really committed to, like, not admitting it. But I know what I saw. <laughs> uh, join the poopy team. <laughs> we were all poopy. I love it. Yeah. I love it so much. Thank you so, so much, Justice, for joining us, for talking about your experience, um, for your vulnerability. I really appreciate it. Um, and mm-hmm. I wanted to let everyone know that we have so many birth resources on the Yelp website. So check it out from preparing for birth. Justice has made videos. She's written articles. We have other articles. Mm-hmm. There's so much there about your support system, about you know, preparing for birth, about your options, um, about positions that you can that you can birth in. And so check it out. And we'd love to see you there. Yeah, so if you guys enjoyed the video, please do like, comment, and share. You know, go check out Justice's social media. She's continuously spitting those birthing facts. Um, And I'm sure we'll have her on in the future talking from postpartum, mental health. So keep in tabs and stay tuned for our next episode. If you enjoyed the Up podcast, please subscribe, share, and leave a comment. And visit youngunitedparents.org for the information, community, and resources young moms and dads need to thrive.